The reading this afternoon is from Acts chapter 9. We begin reading in verse 10 and we'll read to verse 25. We continue looking at the monumental event of the conversion of Apostle Paul. We begin reading in verse 10. By this verse, he has met with Christ. Christ has confronted him. He is blinded by that occasion. He is led to Damascus. And in verse 10, we read, And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might re- receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received sight from within, forthwith, and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. God bless the reading of his word. And let us respond by singing together Psalter Select. Dear congregation, we began seeing last Lord's Day this blessed event in church history, not only in the pages of Scripture, that, but that also affected the church of all ages. I am reading from the book of Acts. We're in chapter 9, but you, you are familiar of how often We preach from Romans, from the first or second letter of Corinthians, from Galatians, or from Ephesians, or from Colossians, or from Philippians, or from the first or second letter of Timothy, or from the letter of Paul to Titus. And these are all the pages that this man who began in chapter 9 as a vicious persecutor of the church of Christ. And he ends, as we saw, a man being persecuted for his love of Christ. He is, as he tells Ananias in verse 15, a chosen 
vessel unto Christ. And that's in verse 15. And I, I want to read again the words surrounding his conversion. In verse 4, it says that he fell to the earth because of that light that was shining round about him from heaven. And in verse 4 we read, And he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So we began seeing um, seven, seven general principles in the conversion of Paul. Uh, today we will look at two more still in this introduction. We, we will just review them in a list form. Um, all, all five that we saw last Lord's Day, and we'll look at two more. But then, in the bulk of this sermon, we will be seeing the marks of true conversion, followed by the marks of true discipleship. There are effects and there are dimensions, there are sights and sounds that will be different in every conversion. And we must avoid the error to think that this conversion of Paul is the blueprint of everyone's conversion. They, they miss on this mark. No, there are things that do not repeat in every conversion. And yet, there are elements of the heart. There are heart issues. There are elements that are of wonder and of transformation. That are principles that do repeat at every conversion. And we find them here. And these are the marks that we hope to look at when we see our first point. And then true discipleship, which, which in itself can point to true conversion as well. But first, for those seven general principles in the conversion of, of Saul, we, we saw number one, that God is the one who saves sinners. The conversion of Paul sets that very clearly. This conversion... Um, did not happen by the will of man because this man did not want to be converted on this day. The Lord was truly found by those who did not seek Him. It truly is that Christ finds the lost sheep. We, we are mistaken because yes, we are the ones who may pray a prayer and we are the ones who look to heaven and ask the Lord to save us, but we don't understand what goes behind in the spiritual way which is the Lord giving you the desire to do this, prodding your heart to do this. And in this passage, we see it. Because in one moment, he is, he is persecuting Christ. Christ confronts him, and he repents and becomes a follower of Christ. And, and this sets the reality that every conversion is a work of God and not a work of man. And we also saw that God saves in different ways. There have been so many different ways in terms of how many people are converted, many and then just one at a time, in terms of who God wishes to use, apostles, newly elected um, deacons, um, men who, who, who are alive in one moment but martyred the next, and now... God uses no one earthly. He uses heaven. He uses Christ coming from heaven to minister to Paul. Human agents are not necessary for conversion. And yet, you could say God never saves without his word. So when Christ comes and ministers to Paul, it is the word of Christ that is being used. And that's how God saves every soul, by the word so God is the one who saves. God saves in different ways. Remember that principle we saw that to persecute a believer is to persecute Jesus. And we derive from that principle that if you resist the gospel, you are not resisting a preacher or a parent, whoever it is that is sharing the gospel with you. If you resist the gospel, you are resisting the Lord Jesus. And, and 
Paul took from this very event the, the root and the foundation of what he developed as the doctrine of our union with Christ. Fourthly, we saw also that conversion is like a courtroom scenario. There's an element of, of being arraigned. Paul is indicted and then he is charged. He could go nowhere. He was bound by the call of Christ and he had to answer. And conversion was the response of his soul because the Lord took him and gave him a willing heart. And he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And then fifthly, we saw that conversion is when your will finally lines up with Christ's will. And we, we will speak a little more of this because we can't speak of the marks of true discipleship without touching on the reality of obedience. Because this is what this is. But sixthly, um, and this is the first one for, for today, is that this encounter teaches us much about sin. It, it is a revelation of, of a certain dynamic about sin. And, and in four ways, especially. And I'll try to be brief. See, this, ma, this man Saul, he was with a heart full of sin. He, he had sinful intentions as he drove into Damascus. And the sins that he was going to commit were that of pursuing hunting down believers, arresting them, threatening them, and those who did not recant, he would execute them. He was destroying the church. It's what Ananias told the Lord Jesus. This is what we've heard of this man Paul. So this, this is the heart of sin that this man has. But then we learn these four things. The first thing is this. Your sins are grievous to Christ. See, this man went with a heart of sin toward Damascus. Jesus met him in the way. And he said, Paul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now, do you, do you realize there the heart of Christ, which is in a sense a heart of grieving? Because Christ is saying like this, Saul, why? Give, give me reasons why you're persecuting me. It's, it's implying this reality. What, what have I done to you that you would persecute me? What have any of these dear children done to you that you persecute them? It was Saul who was there at the stoning of Stephen. So it's implied in this question. What does Stephen do to you, Saul? What violence? What law did he break? What, what crime did he commit or any of my apostles? Why persecutest thou, thou me? See, your sins, Saul, are, are hurting, hurting me because that's what persecuting means. You, you, you have put me in prison. You have scourged me. You have stoned me. Why? Why are you hurting me, Paul? And when Jesus is implying this, he's, he's saying things that he said while he was here on earth. Remember, when he was in the Sabbath day in a synagogue and saw a man that he was hoping to heal. In Mark 3, 5, it says, And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. Now, anger is one emotion. Grief is another. And grief means sorrow. It means sadness. So he wasn't only angry at those men who were thinking he was a breaker of the Sabbath when all he wanted to do was give ability for this poor man to use his hands. And they were all hoping that man would continue with a disability of using his hands. Jesus grieved. It hurt him. In Amos 2.13, when God is speaking of the sins of His people, He puts it in the, in the word vocabulary of grieving. He said, Behold, I am pressed under you as a cart is pressed that is full of sheaves. What's implied there is that it hurts. It gives me sorrow to see you sinning against me. So we learn this dynamic about sin. Paul was full of sin. Jesus stops him in the way and he says, Paul, why are you hurting me and all these sins? 
And of course, it's meant to bring to our hearts, in terms of every sin that we would commit, this reality. And whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, it grieves the Lord Jesus when you and I sin. And we need to understand this. God can use this to help us in terms of of relinquishing sin, of mortifying sin, repenting of sin. But then secondly, there's of course another lesson there. Your sins are grievous to you, to yourself. Because Jesus didn't just say, Paul, why are you persecuting me? He says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. There's a dynamic about sin that not only is Christ hurt and grieving because it makes him sad to see that a creature of his that bears his image is against him. But he's telling us it hurts you too. To say it's hard to kick against the pricks, remember we saw this last time. As as the cowboy is there shooing the cattle, he will use his staff that will have somewhat of a a thorn at the front or a a, a spike. And, And he's kind of prodding the cattle. But if the cattle kicks, it's to his own detriment. That's when he possibly gets hurt all the more by that prick. And Jesus is saying, I've been prodding you by the Spirit. And you've been kicking, and you're the one hurting. That's what's implied. It is hard for you, Paul, to kick against the pricks. When when my servant Stephen was preaching that wonderful sermon, and your heart was not repenting, you were kicking against the pricks. And Paul, it is hard for you. It will hurt you. Your sins are grievous to Christ, Your sins are grievous to yourself. That's what Jesus is telling all of us. Then there's a third thing, which obviously is in the text, is that your sins, my sins, are grievous to others. Because look at what was happening. Saul was going into Damascus to put Christians in jail and to kill many of them, as many as he could, if he had to. And so if Jesus did not stop him and he went on his way, he would be grievous to many more people. He was already grievous to Stephen and he was grievous to many others that it caused them fleeing to Samaria. And Jesus is saying, if you sin, you will grieve more people. So there's this threefold grieving. When you and I sin, we grieve the Lord, we grieve ourselves, we grieve others. We're learning this from this text. And then there's a fourth reality about sin. A very deceptive thing about sin. That it is possible to be sinning under the guise of holiness. Because this is exactly what was happening. If you were to ask Paul, Saul, why are you going into Damascus? He would say it's for the zeal of the Lord. There's there's a heresy going on, and it must be squelched. It is that serious, and I must do it. So he was being zealous for God even while he pursued the people of God. He thought he was doing God's service while he was killing God's people. And we find this in the history of the church. Perhaps during the Counter-Reformation is when it was most um, visible, especially in the brutal um, regime of the Spanish Inquisition, which was mainly in Spain. They went to other countries also, um, um, based in Spain, and, and, and the church sent those who would go and put behind bars anyone who had anything to do with the themes of the Reformation. And those who would not recant were burnt at the stake. And some of the conservative estimates say that the total number of people, men and women, who were burned at the stake during the Spanish Inquisition, and these are the most most conservative estimates, would range between 3,000 to 10,000 people. It's when they're trying to be careful not to be exaggerating. But these very people affirm 
that there has to be added an additional 100,000 to 125,000 people who died in prison as a result of torture and maltreatment. Maybe they didn't make it to the state because they died in the torture rooms. And some of the highest estimates, and this comes from one of the secretaries from Spain who was against the, the, the counter-reformation, so this is why some, some people don't, don't trust his numbers, but he estimates that it was around 32,000 people who died at the stake. And around 300,000 were in the whole trial system and forced to do penance. So... Giving these numbers, you see how many thousands of people were killed in the 14 and 1500s for the sake of serving the Lord. It was under the guise of purity and holiness, and yet they were killing God's people. They, they were doing exactly what Paul was intending to do in Damascus and had been doing in Jerusalem. And there are other numbers we, we, we can talk about. In Portugal, the number they have is that 1,500 were killed during the Counter-Reformation. And you've, you've heard of Bloody Mary in the years 1553 to 58. She had 287. 56 are women who were burnt at the stake. And it was all under the guise of serving God. So sins are grievous. To you, Sin are grief, sins are grievous to Christ. Sins are grievous to everyone. And it's possible to even be sinning while you think you're being holy. So these are things we need to take to heart. We learn these lessons. And, and the seventh and last point of those seven principles that we see here is simply this, that it is true that God can even choose not to use a human, as he has used, at least in this event, Christ coming and speaking to Saul. But it pleases God to use people. This is something we need to understand. We, we are not necessary. That is something to glorify Christ and God. But to comfort us, we can learn it pleases him to use people. And this is what we see in the text. Um, Ananias was not used to evangelize Paul, but he was used to encourage Paul. And, and we need to be careful when we say this, because even though, yes, it's Christ speaking to Paul, and then Paul is converted, but you need to understand that, that there, have been, there have been those whom God has used, even the sermon of Stephen is very possibly coming back to the heart of Saul. And in the reproach of Christ, Christ is using people. And so I'm not trying to say here that, that, that people are never used. I'm, I'm trying even to show God is pleased to use people. But we need to understand, it's not that we, we are necessary for God. He, he can save souls from above. He can save John the Baptist in the womb. The Holy Spirit was already in him. And this humbles us. We need to understand this. We, as, as evangelists, as we would share the gospel, never, we should never think that we're, we're the ones. But God is pleased to use us, and that comforts us. And so let us, let us go to the marks of true conversion. There, there are three marks that we hope to consider. There, there are, of course, many marks of conversion, as we would find in other events, but there are three main ones um, that come from this text. The first one is this, that true conversion is true transformation. N not every conversion will have that amount of light shining round about you, but every conversion has to have true transformation. And this is something that we see so dramatic in this event. Because, as we've been saying, it begins with a man hating the church. And he becomes a man who is in the church. And a man who's hating Christ. And yet, we read that he is here proving that this is very Christ. Look at verse 20. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But it begins with a man who is wanting to put behind bars anyone who believes in this very truth. This is a transformation. 
It is as 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And it must be this way because as we've already seen, conversion is a work of God. If it is a work of God, how could God ever do something incomplete or halfway or not at all? If you have someone who says, I'm converted, I'm a Christian, and yet he's living openly in sin. See, that would be to say, if if that is true, well, then God did no work at all that's observable in your life. But the thing that is true, of course, is that, that that is not a true conversion. A true conversion is not marked by my testimony or yours or what we would say about ourselves. It is God's work, and so there will be God's mark upon it. And we come from a place where we have seen a a human work. When we look at Simon Magus, this, this is exactly what happened in his life. That was not a work of God in the heart of Simon. He was a man who used sorcery, remember, and bewitched people, and giving out that he himself was some great one. It is said that people round about him gave heed to him and said, this man is the great power of God. So he loved power. He loved that fame. He loved that influence. And when he heard the gospel and he heard Philip, what, what happened? Nothing. See, in the heart, in truth and foundation, nothing happened because that man who was obsessed with power When he entered the realm of religion, he was still obsessed with power. And and the text makes it so clear because it says that when he saw the power that Peter had in placing his hand upon people and they received the Holy Spirit, Simon offered money and said, give me that power. That is not conversion. That's the work of man. And Peter made that clear in rebuking him sharply, saying, you have no part in this. Your heart is evil. But true conversion, there will be transformation. And beloved, this is where if if anybody who is going through an issue where there's something of an addiction, and what is an addiction? It is basically a sin that we cannot stop sinning. It may take over your whole constitution. There are people who go to the hospital. They need to be detoxed. There there is the need of medical intervention even. But, But if it is that your quest is for pleasure and you're using an item or a thing or or some kind of, of, of seeking after something, a person, a thing, a place, and that becomes your obsession... It would be right for that soul to wonder, am I a true believer? Because I, I cannot think of how I can succeed this without Christ. And now I don't say this only to add to the tension of what the poor soul is suffering, but I do say this so that this poor suffering soul would have Christ because that is what he or she needs the most to conquer any sin. Or put sin to death. True conversion has a true transformation. And we go then to the true Christ, pleading for that and never leaving him until he gives it. And that's, that's the key. It's not to bring a certain kind of guilt now thinking, oh, pastor, but now added to that grief of addiction, now I am grieving, wondering if I'm saved. That's, that's never a problem. I, I tell souls, I tell my own heart, if ever there's a doubt that I am saved, then go to Jesus and plead that he will save you. Trust in him and it's solved, it's dealt with. If, if, you're, if you're now making me feel guilty because I'm, in a sense, evangelizing you for the betterment of your own soul, there's a problem here. 
You see, you're, you're, you're so given to your vice that you're not liking the advice that may come from heaven itself to help you against it. Because if you are a born-again creature, then you are thankful for the advice to seek Christ. Imagine if Paul were to go after a few days and maybe Paul still needs to be sharpened in a certain area and another because he never became perfect with his conversion. And imagine if Peter were to come to Paul and say, Paul, are you sure you were saved? I can be sure of one thing. Paul would not be arrogant and angry at Peter. He would be broken and meek and say, Peter, what is it in my testimony that gives you the doubt of my salvation? Because if there's one thing I want to be sure is that Christ is my Lord and Savior. See, beloved, when when a soul is angry that someone would question your salvation, that even shows that very likely the transformation hasn't yet happened. Because we read this morning, who are those who are invited to that table to eat? It's the meek. That means we're humble. And if somebody were to come to me, I pray that I would have the heart to say, what, what makes you think that, brother? Because I don't, I don't want anyone to doubt my salvation. And I trust that it is true. True salvation True conversion has a true transformation. And then number two, true conversion acknowledges sin. True conversion acknowledges sin. If you are truly saved, you have truly confessed your sins. Now, notice this this whole narrative. Saul, he was severely rebuked by Jesus. These are very serious um, accusations. Jesus is saying, you are persecuting me. Paul, you are kicking against the pricks. These, this is not just someone who is a little nervous. It is not someone who's having to, 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 to maybe um, start trusting a little more. No, it's someone who is murdering, in essence, Christ, who's grievous to Christ himself, to others. He's been a murderer. He's been putting people to death. Paul never retorted once. He never defended himself. He never tried to explain and he never said, I I was not aware or I did not mean to or I was blind. I I, I did not know. He he never said, well, you, you, you you hadn't called me in a saving way earlier for me not to sin what I sinned. No, only complete compliance with the charge. What wilt thou have me to do. See, it's as if Paul is saying, yes, Lord, it is true. And seeing that these things are so, seeing that this is so serious, that, that, that I have persecuted thee and kicked against prodding of the Holy Spirit, then, then tell me what I should do. And I will do it. Reveal to me what is thy will. And it will be my will. And then Paul, when he had ample opportunities and wrote letters to Timothy, to the Romans, to the Corinthians. Listen to the things he said. We know that Paul acknowledged his sin. He told Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.15, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Romans 7.24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? And to the Corinthians he said, For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of Christ, the church of God. So true conversion is true transformation, And it acknowledges sin. And thirdly, and lastly, true conversion is interested solely, entirely in Christ. 
And we, we go again to the very words of Saul as he lay in the ground and with, with his eyes shut because the light was so great. He hadn't yet found out that he was actually blind. And when, when Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Notice what he says. It's, it's like there's already some element of, of, of a coming in submission to that one who comes so majestically over him. And he says, who art thou, Lord? Who art thou? And and this revealed the interest in his heart for the blessed one who manifested himself to him. Who are you? How may I know you? What what must I call you? you? You know my name and you accuse me of wrong, but may I know who thou art? It resembles, it reminds us a little of Jacob wrestling with the angel and would not let him go until he knew the name of the angel and that the angel would bless him. Who art thou? And, and, and again, we have this encouragement that we, we know this is true because from this moment on, this interest in Christ only grew and we have it in the writings of Paul. If we were to stop to say from from the New Testament, whom we learn more about Paul, about Christ, and who he is, and the doctrines of Christ, and the divinity of Christ, it would be through Apostle Paul. It is Paul who taught us that Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. It is from Paul that we learn that in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians 2, 9. That he is the head of the church. That he is the bridegroom. That he is the stone that the builders rejected. He even breathed an anathema on anyone who dared to present another gospel. Which would mean anything in terms of graduating from Jesus. He's the one who said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. He's the one who taught husbands that we are to love our wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. There's absolutely no other author who has brought this principle directly for husbands. We are to be like Christ. It is he who said... I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Wasn't it Christ, wasn't it Paul who said, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So you see that that question, maybe of course it didn't have the, the, the whole um, gamut of understanding when he said, Who art thou, Lord? But that remained in his heart. And he became a a learner of Christ, a student of Jesus, and he taught us all. That's the mark of true conversion. There's transformation. There's repentance. And there's an interest in Christ. Now, secondly, our Second point and last point, the marks of true discipleship. Now, some of these I will only mention today. We won't have time to go into them. They'll go, Lord willing, into the next sermon. But there's six truths here that we see from the, from the moment he arrives in Damascus and is blessed by Ananias' ministration to him and encouragement. And then he begins preaching, but his preaching is so, so powerful, and a lot like Stephen's must have been, that they are now planning to kill him, and he needs to be sent in the middle of the night in a basket out of Damascus. And we learn at least these six things about true discipleship. The first one is this, that the true disciple desires the will of God. Remember I said I was going to come back to this. When, when he says to Jesus... What wilt thou have me to do? Beloved, that that phrase is like the motto of the disciple. That's what a disciple is. 
The word disciple means a student. And so we are to sit at the feet of our rabbi, our teacher. And what that rabbi teaches us, we will follow, we will obey. And in, in the whole discipleship of the Old Testament, you would, you would so much learn from that teacher. And there would be a technique where you would come into the specific meetings throughout the week. And there would be questions and answers. A lot like, like the catechism that developed in, in, in the Reformation. And then there would be memorization and there would be um, a following up with what the student was learning. And that student would grow to become a teacher himself. And he would have disciples who would follow. The, the commitment would only grow as the disciple would grow. It, it would be unheard of a disciple who disobeyed his teacher. Because that then would mean you're not a disciple. You're you're an anti-disciple. And and we find this in Apostle Paul from this very day. What wilt thou have me to do? And then we look at the life of Paul. And we see how willing he was to suffer for the sake of Christ. No matter what the danger was. No matter how many days he would be shipwrecked. No matter how many times he would be scourged. No matter how many times he would have to be behind bars. No matter how many stones would come at him. He would not recant. He would not stop preaching. He would not soften the gospel to make it where the Greek world would maybe stop being so antagonistic. No. He followed. He obeyed. And that's what a true disciple does. And then secondly, a true disciple prays. Now, This is emphatic that it's not just that Ananias comes and finds him praying. Jesus tells Ananias, when when Jesus is telling who who, who Paul is, whom he must meet, he gives the address. He says he is in the street, which is called Straight. And then he gave the name of the person who, who would live in that street, inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul. He gave Saul's birth um, of Tarsus. And then this, for behold, he prayeth. There's there's a little parallel here. You can imagine those angels who are there looking at those shepherds and they are telling them that the Savior was born and that they will find him in Bethlehem laying in a manger. And, And that was like a sign because no baby would be laying in a manger and wrapped in swaddling clothes. That was a sign to find Jesus. And and it's almost the same grammatical structure that Jesus is saying. I will give you a sign I'll give you his address. I'll give you the house. And this is a sign. He prays. And right there, beloved, we we really have brought to our hearts, if you're a disciple, you pray. Can this be described of you? That your sole interest is in Christ to do his will. And that you pray. Matthew Henry said, You may soon find the living man without breath as a living Christian without prayer. Prayer has been called the heartbeat of the believer. So that if the man stops praying, then he will stop living. Or maybe indicate that he never did live. And we need to Pray beyond our prayers with the family and beyond our prayers in church, beyond the stated times of prayer. Because this is not the kind of prayer that Paul was praying. Jesus said, behold, he prayeth. It's like Jesus is describing who this man is. He is, he is a man who prays. And, and probably Paul was so now interested in praying because it's like he finally learned how to pray. And what is it that he found? He found the mediator. Before he used to pray through the priest who was the mediator in the sacrificial system, it was actually the priest who prayed for him. There was all that mechanism in the Old Testament. Yes, you did pray, but your prayers were actually ceremonially and spiritually received through the sacrifice of the priest. But Paul now has learned that his priest is in heaven. And so he's praying directly to the God of heaven through his mediator who is there. 
And that's what we need to discover. This is what we need to find out so that we pray more and more fervently and more honestly and more sincerely. Prayer is a mark of true discipleship. Obedience in prayer. Then thirdly, the true disciple desires to be baptized. And this, in a sense, is connected with obedience. It's, it's actually um, just a unfolding of the desire that the true disciple has to obey what God does. But I single it out because it's, it's one of the sacraments. And it's significant to think that a true believer really prizes the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. They're only those two. And the true believer yearns and desires those means by which he obeys the Lord and grows in the Lord and testifies to the world of the Lord. And remember, attached to the Lord's Supper, we, we have it that we will remember the Lord's death, but it says to proclaim, that we are proclaiming the Lord's death until He comes. If you have no interest in the Lord's Supper, it's, it's as if saying you have no interest in His death. If you have no interest in baptism, it's like you have no interest in what it means that your sins can be forgiven. It's like someone saying, can it really be forgiven? Was his death really that powerful? And when Ananias came, and in verse 17, he put his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight. Forthwith he arose and was baptized." This is not just here in the text. It's just a little narrative. And by the way, he was baptized. You, you've noticed Luke is making a, 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 a categorical, um, like, think of Acts as this, as this manual of the church. And Peter preaches. 3,000 people are baptized. We hear that people are baptized throughout all those conversions. And we just finished seeing, well, there had been all the Samaritans and they were being baptized. And then the eunuch, and he was baptized. And now Paul is being baptized. See, the true disciple, he, he hears something like Mark 16, 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. And then we understand, well, it's not baptism that saves. Mark, Jesus even says, but he who does not believe will be condemned. We, we never read that he who is not baptized will be condemned. So a disciple isn't baptized because he thinks, so oh, that's how I'll be saved. And we don't come to Lord's Supper because we think, well, that's how I'm saved. No, but we are baptized and we do come to the Lord's Supper because we have been saved. Now, put this into the, into the whole context. As soon as believers from the Jewish world were coming into the church, receiving the sign of the covenant of baptism, then we see that households are being baptized and babies are being presented to be baptized. And baptized in becomes a symbol that either yourself, because you're new to the faith, or you're bringing your babies and you're acknowledging, I belong to the Lord. My babies belong to the Lord. It is a profession of faith to the world, to the seen world. And a true disciple desires to confess Christ publicly. That's, in essence, how you see the baptism of Paul. He's identifying with Christ fully. So fully that now he's in danger of dying as a believer. Because now he might be persecuted and they begin. And then fourthly, the converted soul desires the communion of saints. Now I'll close with this one. Now, beloved, this perhaps is the one passage that impresses this upon our hearts in such a dramatic way, we, we can go many places in God's word that would say how important it is for you to love the brethren and that a true Christian loves the brethren. And we think of John who said that if you say you love God, but you don't love a brother, then you lie and do not the truth. Because how can you love someone that you don't see and you don't love someone that you do see? 
Now the text begins where Paul hated the people who were in Damascus who were calling upon the name of Jesus. And he ends up as protected by those very people because he was so identified with them that he's in danger of his own life. Look how precious when we read in verse 19, And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples. Beloved, there's a miracle right there in this phrase. These are the very people he had letters and authority to bind and take to prison. Can you imagine Paul sitting with him thinking, I I was planning to kill you and to kill you and to murder you and to put you in prison if you wouldn't recant and you and you and you and, and the little babies and seeing little children who would be fatherless and motherless. And here he is fellowshipping with them. So if a man who hated these brethren is now fellowshipping with them, how can it be possible that we may have people today who say they're Christians, but they may say things like this. I've heard this from fellow Christians who say, you know, I I love Jesus, but it's hard for me to love Christians. I can understand the reality of the tensions because we're sinners. What, what is there to really be loved when, when we're not perfect? We're supposed to be like Jesus, but we're not. I know that we can say things that offend. But see, when we're, when we're true believers, we understand this and we're patient with others because we know you must be patient with me and, and we know how gracious and loving Christ was to us. How can I dare not forgive some offense that comes from another brother. We, we live under that reality and so we freely love one another. But when you're not a true believer, that, that won't happen. You will judge harshly. You might sin against them, but that doesn't mean too much because you understand your imperfections. But when they sin against you, that's enough. I'll go to another church. Maybe they'll be nicer to me there. And they find that they're sinners there too. You're only saved by grace, but sinners still. And then some other offense, and they leave that church too because their hearts just grow with bitterness. I've heard a person say, why would I go to church? Because my children will turn out like them. These are people who don't love the body of Christ. And it shows that they don't love the head of the body. Because you see, beloved, who is it ultimately who who loves the church the most? It's not Paul. And you can think of the Christian who is the most um, involved in all church activities. It's not you. It's not me. It's Jesus. I remember a sermon many, many years ago that I heard from, from R.C. Sproul. And the title was, Who Loves the Church? And it was implying, like, is it me? Is it you? Who is it? Is it that lady? Is it that man? And, and the whole climax was, it's Jesus. Jesus loves the church. He gave his life for it. Beloved, you see, when we see it this way, how can I dare um, have any kind of tension with a brother or sister and love him or her less or not want to spend time with him or her? And if we think of someone who would have a hard time going to church, maybe he would say, you know, give me a a couple days. I was planning to kill these people. I don't know if I can be there Sunday. But he's certain days with the disciples. And if I read on more, we we read more of how he is there being comforted by the disciples. He arrives in Jerusalem. They're scared of him. But then they see who he is and he's comforted by them. The true disciple desires the communion of saints. And we hope to consider the the other points as we consider this passage. We see Paul's escape. He He is now the persecuted, even though he began as the persecutor. This passage is so full of majesty, so full of grace. I pray that God may use it. In, in our lives. It, it is not just a narrative. It is teaching us the nature of sin. It is teaching us to see if we are true believers. I, I want to end with this very solemn warning. One word, 
to those who are not yet converted and therefore who are not yet disciples. And I want to bring still something from this morning's sermon. We heard Christ's utterance from the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we need to understand that if we are not saved, we run the danger and the risk to be the ones who would have the reality and the nature of that cry in our lips flowing from our hearts for all eternity. Because on the cross, Christ uttered that as one who is suffering hell. You, we read it in the form that, that there's this belief that his descending into hell was like climaxed in that moment of darkness and where Christ uttered those words. It's as if his soul now in hell fell forsaken of God. And what is God teaching this? He is warning each and every one of us to, to awake that if you are in the stupor of unbelief, you are in danger of having to be the one to utter those very words from the place of eternal forsakenness where the face of God's love is hidden from you, but the face of God's wrath is there shining powerfully upon all those who are condemned. Beloved, this is the day of salvation. If anyone tells you to wait to be saved. They are not using biblical premises. And they do not understand the realities of hell. You nor I know the number of heartbeats that we still have. God saved Saul that day. And it is God who has to save your soul. But He does use the gospel. He is pleased to use sermons. May you this day, if you've never done it, say the very words, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Acknowledge your sin and plead for salvation from above. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious, glorious God, we thank Thee, Lord Jesus, for stopping Saul in the way. And Lord, we see that every single salvation, even though we do not experience the same amount of drama, it is still Thou stopping us in the way. And we pray, Lord, would Thou do this to the souls that are lost. Thou knowest, Lord, who they are. Thou knowest how many. And Lord, we pray that Thou would prod these hearts, that they would stop kicking against the pricks, that they would be awakened from this stupor of unbelief, this sleep of death. And Lord, would Thou majestically and miraculously Bring to the heart the willingness to come to Christ and to look to Jesus and thank Him for being in the place of forsakenness for sinners so that we can be certain that we will never be there if we believe in Him. Lord, we pray, may souls come to Christ we pray that these words would, would prod every one of our hearts to examine, to see if we are in Christ. There may be those who are feeling they are safe and that they, that they enjoy salvation, but they are lacking in these marks in a very clear way. Lord, would Thou be the one to convict these hearts? Lord, we cannot do it, but Thy Word, Lord, has these principles. Speak to the hearts, Lord, we pray. Make us all true disciples of the Lord Jesus. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. We'll be singing together.